All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined from Tucson, Arizona, just over the border there in uh, Arizona, by Helen Fanucci. How are you doing, Helen? I'm doing great. It's nice to be here today. Thank you. Yeah, and Helen is an MIT-trained engineer, has built her reputation and career managing teams responsible for billions, not millions, billions of dollars of quota. And she developed the Love Your Team system of sales management over a 25-year career on the front lines of top tech companies like Apple, Sun, IBM, Microsoft. And your book, Love Your Team, a survival guide for sales managers in a hybrid world um, launches November 1st. Is that right? The yeah, past November. It past November. That's what I thought. It launched last mm -hmm. November. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and you have your own Love Your Team podcast, which focuses on retaining top talent and building high performance teams. So let's talk about your 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 book, Helen, because uh, we just had just before we came on air, we were just having that interesting discussion about, you know, retaining top talent Obviously, retaining top talent when times are good, everybody would say, yes, 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 we've got to retain top talent. But now when we're in like recession and there's all these layoffs, uh, uh, as you were saying, like, is it the same? Do you still have to retain top talent or do they retain themselves because they don't have anywhere to go? Or is that being complacent and, you know, you could shoot yourself in the foot that way? Yeah, well, I still think it's so critical and uh, to retain top talent. And it's probably even more critical now than ever because you need people who really deliver high productivity. And if you lose your top sales talent, let's say their quota is a million a year, it might take you three months to replace them and then another six months to get up to full strength. So that's potentially seven and a half, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars 750000 dollars of quota attainment at risk. And so, um, you know, top talent has a choice of where they go. And it is ever so, you know, important that sales leaders keep a robust pipeline of talent. And um, many companies are prioritizing, you know, retaining that top talent. But if the workload from layoffs and stuff, or the lack, if, or if there's changes in philosophy on flexibility or things that are important to top talent, you know, they may leave. So it's critical to pay attention. Yeah. And, and I guess it's even uh, exacerbated in some ways by the fact that um, the balance of power has shifted a little bit. Uh, certainly now that remote work has become so, um, you know, so normal part of how we operate but it means that 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 top talent can probably work for any company they really want to in that in the space that they're in without having to leave their their home office yeah that's very true and you know um flexibility is super important for people and many people moved out of urban centers or mm near where the headquarters location might be. And in fact, when you're thinking about hiring a new seller, you don't need to pay as much attention to where the customer is because mm -hmm. the customers are not in their office either. So then it becomes kind of a different equation to think about, okay, what do I really need and who's the best person for that job and develop new strategies for connecting with a customer in person maybe around the executive briefings or industry conferences or things like that. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, and I think this obviously requires a shift in mindset on behalf of management. I mean, particularly if you've come up through very traditional organizational structures and hierarchies and all of that, I think accommodating a hybrid workforce and holding on to your best people, like your top salespeople, it means that you have to be a lot more flexible and you have to communicate more. Yeah, I think it's critical, particularly when you're not co-located in the same office, that managers are setting really clear outcome-based expectations and kind of what they expect from their talent and then uh, their, their team members, frankly, and that may be delivering quota, of course, or 3x pipeline coverage, but it may be additional things such as leading a cross-functional team and mobilizing 
internal company resources on behalf of the customer. Those are skills as well that are mm -hmm. critical for many sales uh, sales um, account reps or relationship managers, sellers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so being really clear and communicating and then having a mechanism, a process for checkpointing. I do it every uh, two weeks for 30 minutes, um, sometimes more frequently if there's big deals that are moving rapidly, sometimes less, uh, but you figure out what works for you. But it's all, um, it's very critical so that you can make sure that team members are on track. And I really think it's critical to build a strong trust relationship with your sellers, particularly so that they feel like they can talk to you when things are going awry and get your help uh, to keep a deal on track or rescue a deal if it's going off track. Yeah, uh, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's why I think one of the one of the greatest lacks i think is is sales management and and that's not the fault that's not to put the blame on sales managers it's to it's the fact that most people end up in sales leadership positions because they were good sales people they were top sales people and they got promoted into promoted in uh, in parentheses uh and because it's it's often quite the opposite but never given any training, never even given basic management training, let alone like sales leadership training. And then we expect them to be able to suddenly switch from being a, 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 a you know, a sole producer to being the leader. And, and, and that's why I think the, the statistic used to be like 15 to 16 months is however long um, uh, VPs of sales last. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I wrote my book is because so many people were concerned about managing remote teams. And I decided to fashion the book after kind of a how to survival guide, literally. Mm -hmm. So I have all these uh, chapters about, OK, you know, situations that sales managers encounter, like introducing themselves to a brand new team. How do you do that in an effective way so that you're building trust and creating um, clarity with your team about what you expect and so that they get to know you. Um, so it's really intended to be something, a handbook, so people, sales leaders can refer to it when they um, have a situation and they want some guidance or help or, you know, how a, an approach for managing a team and, um, you know, whether it's performance management or, supporting a you know a big deal and needing to get um the stakeholders across the com company all aligned mm -hmm. to support that deal so it's it's both from a hybrid work point of view mm -hmm. but also i've gotten feedback that new leaders um have found it valuable as well as sellers aspiring to be managers yeah no ab absolutely and i think part of the um, part of the challenge, as you said, is, you know, people are remote and hybrid and all that. But it is it is building that trust because, I mean, let's face it, I mean, sales is probably one area where there's often a kind of little bit of friction between sales leaders and, and sales people, even when they're all together. Um, so being able to build really strong trust relationships, you touched on something there because you were saying where they can support and serve. Yes, you're in charge. You need to make sure they're hitting their quota, but then you have to support and serve, not be the super closer. Remember the guy who parachutes in at the end, elbows you out of the way and closes the deal for you. Yeah. You know, a leader cannot maximize their quota and sales results by being that person to parachute in or taking over a big deal. You're really robbing your team members of doing the whole job. And they're actually a multiplier effect for you. So I look for opportunities where I can support and empower them. And they're running the show and doing the whole job even to the extent where if they have a big customer meeting and presentation, and let's say it's virtual, I'm in the background. I yeah. turn my camera off after the introductions. I take notes and action items for the seller so they can be present in the meeting. And then it enables us to debrief. And so that's an example, if you will, of supporting the team. There are other mm -hmm. examples uh, of what I do, but um, 
if you're not empowering your team members to do the the full job, I think you rob yourself of an opportunity to maximize your results. No, I I totally agree. Um, One of the companies that I used to run when I did go on sales calls, and I always made sure that as you said, I was in the background, right? I was sat at the end of the table. I sat at the back of the room or whatever it was because because I also wanted to communicate to the potential customer. I trust my team. These people are good. I don't need to be, I'm here as, you know, I'm here to add some value hopefully, but I'm not here to do this. I trust these people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, you know, the other thing too is that, um, the skills or the necessity, I believe, for a leader to build trust in a relationship and have transparency with their sellers, but also understand what matters to your sellers on their terms Mm -hmm. and figure out how you'll support it. You know, they might want to get promoted or have flexibility. It's really the same skills that I expect the sellers to have with customers. Mm -hmm. Build trust, relationship with a customer, find out what you know, matters to the customer on their terms and then figure out how our solution will address that. So it's um, it's kind of modeling the behavior I expect to see in the sellers. I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic point uh, that you just made there. Um, and I never thought of it that way. So thank you. Uh, but yeah, but, but as I said, I mean, we often just take a top salesperson, throw them into sales leadership, don't give them any guidance or whatever, and they sink or swim. But what you just said there was if they take their selling skills, which made them top producers in the first place and apply it to their team, then you're actually you may actually be one of the better managers in the whole company across any division. Right. Think I like to think of your team, your sellers as your number one customer Mm -hmm. because you're in trouble if they leave and you can't retain talent. And you're also in trouble if you can't maximize your quota objective and revenue results. And so really empowering the team and also supporting their ambitions. So when I have had sellers who want to be managers, Mm -hmm. I'll have them shadow me. I'll have them do a forecast call on my behalf, particularly when I'm on vacation and, you know, kind of spend more time with them on coaching them about situations, um, leading the team, various things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, you can, you might think, geez, then you lose your seller and you have to backfill them. Well, if you're known as a leader who promotes and um, the careers of their team, you actually become a manager that's a magnet for talent. People mm-hmm. want to work for you. And so it actually ends up being super positive uh, in the end. And so I think one, it's the right thing to do because you're not going to no one's going to work for you forever. Either they'll go to another company uh, where they can be promoted or find a way to support them and promote them within, you know, your own company. Yeah. And, and, and what I also find is, is, um, is really interesting is the coaching aspect, right? Because, Nobody is really taught how to be a coach. Most people have their, most people, especially here, I find in the States, most people's um, experience with coaching is like their high school football coach or their basketball coach or their volleyball coach, or whatever. And it's like, I tell you what to do. And then, you know, shout at you from the, like from the sidelines. And that doesn't work. That doesn't work with people because coaching, as I said, like coaching is not telling people what to do. Uh, How much have you, how much difference do you see when somebody is taught how to coach properly? The difference that you get, the difference and the uplift that you get? Yeah, um, well, good question. So uh, coaching and feedback are usually confused to be the same thing. I'm going to coach them, which means I'm going to tell them what to do and give them feedback on how they're screwing up or something like that. But coaching, I think, done well. And I I subscribe to um, the coaching habit. We had a course and Michael um, Bungay Steiner, who uh, created that program, which is really understanding, asking good questions. Now, your seller comes to you with a situation. You don't have all the background and insight. So ask them good questions and try to help them basically arrive at their own answer. And it might be things like, well, what kind of support are you looking 
uh, from me, you know, looking for right now from me? How can I help you right now? And, you know, what is the biggest obstacle you're facing? And why do you think the customer's behaving that way? Is there some situation that might be causing that? And really ask the questions and probe because it's impossible to really know all the circumstances. And it also builds a stronger muscle with the seller mm -hmm. so that they are problem solving and are then able to act more independently. And and here's another thing that is, uh, it's kind of a human nature thing uh, too, is that we always tend to focus in on people's uh, what we perceive as people's weaknesses or deficiencies, right? So it's like I always, I always use this example. Like I can't stand uh, annual performance reviews. I honestly think they're a waste of time. Um, but it's like most people's experience of it is is well, here we go, John. Here is two things that you did pretty good this year, and here's fifty two things that you need to work on. And then you spend all your time on that, and we don't instead focus on. What are the strengths? How do we how do we maximize the strengths? How do we make sure your job like fits, you know, what you're really good at? Yeah. So first of all, performance reviews ought not to be a surprise. And yeah. it's not a time to dump on the person. So well, you should be checkpointing and say, gosh, yeah. that was really great the way you navigated that complex situation mm -hmm. or the difficult, you yeah. know, customer escalation or what have you. And also just, you know. Um, highlight the skills and behaviors you expect to see and highlight the strengths because everybody has their strengths. It's the whole strength finder. People, you know, play to their strengths. And then there's often, you know, a couple things that uh, people can do, everybody can improve on, sure. right? Your seller can improve on. And frame it in the context of what their ambition is. Like, well, you know, you said you wanted to be a manager, but but what I'm the feedback I'm hearing when you're leading this cross-functional mm -hmm. team is that you're really not delegating effectively. And so then I'm not sure, you know, that can be in conflict with your goal of being a manager, but link it to their ambition of what they've said that that they care about because it, if it's something that doesn't really isn't really critical for what their ambition is, they're probably not going to address it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's very true. And I think one other thing, and I think this is sort of kind of peculiar to sales in some in some respect, is I mean it's also in many I guess other areas too. But it's like the only career path we ever seem to put is like you do well. And then you move up to manage manager, right? We've got to be more creative with different career paths. And why, if you're a really good salesperson, I mean, why can't we do something that makes you feel that you are achieving, that you're progressing in your career? You may be, you know, you may not want to be a manager or, you know, you, you may not be suited to being a manager, but we've seen so linear in, in, in everything. And it's always the next step up for you is to manage people. And to be honest, when I have that conversation, we used to have that conversation with people and they'd say, what do you want to do? Well, I want to manage people. And I'd always go, well, why do you want to do that? <laughs> let me get, let really? me tell you what it's really like. <laughs> really? Really? Me, oh. But what do, you, what do you think of that, about the fact that we, we're very, we're not very creative in career paths, particularly for salespeople? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different things. One is there's, you know, different job levels, mm -hmm. promotion within being a sale, a seller. And mm -hmm. at some point you top out that. So I've had sellers that didn't want to be managers, but they also got fatigued with what yeah. they were currently doing. So maybe they'll go um, work on another account. Uh, if they're on one strategic account, work on another account. Or maybe they're on a mid mid market and they want to get up into bigger enterprise accounts. I've also had sellers that moved from sales into you know channel management, managing partners and various things. And in a larger organization, there's often the ability to move across domains, if you will, of or teams. Uh, still connected with a customer, but not necessarily straight up sales or different kinds of customers. So it, it does take some creativity for sure. And at some point, though, individual contributors top out in terms of their 
level and managers can usually get promoted if they're good and they do a great job um, above and beyond, but it's pretty hard for sellers to get promoted to that higher level, but it doesn't, but the, the level is, you know, salary and various things, but it, it can, it doesn't mean that that manager at a higher level is making more money than the seller. Yeah. Cause often seller, if, if money's the motivation, often sellers can make more money. And so it really depends. Like if you don't care about, you know, supporting your team and focusing on your team members, don't be a manager, save everybody the grief. <laughs> yeah, that's it's an excellent point. And no, and I, I I agree with you. But ultimately, if your salespeople make more money than you do, you're probably making more money than you would have if they weren't making more. Money right, you, exactly. You know, that sounds very complicated, but I think you get the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think the creativity and I think the also one of the things is when we tend to go, oh, well, if it ain't broke, right? So, you know, Helen's Helen's knocking it out of the park. She always does. Seems to be fine. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to bring up anything. And I think that's probably one of the biggest dangers too. I mean, you don't want to like put ideas into people's head, but at the same time, you want to really know where they are rather than be surprised because one day you could come and say, oh, no, I'm totally, I'm burnt out. Sorry, I got a new job doing somewhere else. And I'll be like, whoa, wh how did that happen? Why didn't you tell me? And you think, well, why didn't you ask? <laughs> well, it comes down to the relationship yeah. and trust and transparency. And I just, it's naive to think anybody's going to work for the same person or the same company forever. So mm -hmm. it's a stop on someone's career journey. So let's be adults about it <laughs> and find out what they, you know, what makes them tick and figure out how you can support them because maybe they'll stay with you longer. Um, and if they feel supported as well as they can grow and have new experiences that matter to them. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point too, because uh, I think especially as the generations filter th through, it's looking like, you know, millennials and those, they don't, st you know, they stay less at a job now than other people. They, they're happy to bounce around. Um, and we thought we moved, but, you know, most of us moved like every six, seven years, maybe seven. Eight, they're now moving every one and a half, two years. So to your point, I think this is going to be an ongoing, uh, as you said, be a grown up about it and be realistic about it and try to get the best, <laughs> you know, try, try to make it so they want to stay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, really, I think you get better performance when they're empowered and you have that trust relationship. Because I have heard of situations where sellers and managers have an adversarial relationship and they're mm -hmm. afraid, sellers are afraid to say, oh, a deal is going to fall out of the forecast. Well, you're robbing the manager of the opportunity to help. And I don't think anyone does their best work in a fear situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, listen, Helen, this is fantastic. Such great insights. All of Helen's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so I just left Microsoft um, hot off the press, and I'm now in the process of formulating um, my next step, which will likely include starting my own company. And so I'm in the process of thinking that through right now. Uh, but I've been a sales leader for and a manager and leader of hybrid, hybrid, hybrid teams in tech for over 25 years. And um, I, you can find me on LinkedIn. My book is on Amazon. And um, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Yeah, absolutely. I'd highly encourage you all to check out the book. Uh, hey, listen, the world is changing so rapidly that we all need help. So I would go check it out. Listen, thanks again, Helen. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.